fossil fuel uh, combustion and use. Um, my colleagues uh, have invited you here today to testify about President Biden's so-called war on energy, which we know uh, doesn't exist. Uh, for better or worse, the United States is producing record high levels of oil and natural gas today. It's never been so high, so our colleagues can breathe easy um, if that is their principal interest. At the same time, President Biden and the Department of Energy in partnership with uh, Democrats in Congress are making historic and necessary investments in clean energy technology. Climate change is the defining crisis of our time, and we know that burning fossil fuels is by far the leading factor in contributing to climate change, a fact that fossil fuel companies knew about decades ago, but suppressed. Our recent joint staff report with the Senate Budget Committee showed the evolution of big oil's efforts to deceive the American public from outright denial of the facts that they understood in the 1960s and 70s, and then more up-to-date, uh, subtle propaganda and disinformation efforts today to try to lead us away from the solutions that we need. Um, because of this deception, we've lost crucial decades in which we could have been systematically transitioning away from dirty, polluting fossil fuels to the cleaner alternative energies we need. Now we are forced to take much more dramatic actions to transition to clean energy as quickly as possible. With every passing day, the consequences of climate change uh, grow in intensity. Uh, in just the last week, we've learned uh, not only are the sea levels rising, not only are we seeing record forest fires, record drought, record flooding in different parts of the country, hurricanes of record velocity, um, but there is even a greater disruption taking place to people's uh, daily lives. Um, there are swarms of mosquitoes in Harris County, te Texas, in unprecedented numbers and sizes. The oceans are actually changing colors, um, we are in a, a very rapid downward descent uh, because of climate change. Um, researchers have found that the economic damage caused by climate change, climate change is six times worse than was pre previously predicted. A new paper estimates that just one degree Celsius of warming would cause the world's GDP to decline by 12%. We already hit more than one degree Celsius of warming since pre-industrial times and are currently on track to hit three degrees Celsius of warming by the end of the century. We must break free from the carbon trap, which will require significant effort and investment into the clean energy transition. The Department of Energy, I believe, is doing that thanks to funding from the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Because of these historic investments the American people have made, the U.S. is on track by 2030 to double the amount of clean energy we generate and to cut emissions by 40 to 50 percent compared to 2005 levels. The administration's focus on clean energy has also spurred over $400 billion of new investments in clean energy by private companies, about half of which is specifically being invested in manufacturing today. The U.S. economy has added 800,000 manufacturing jobs since the start of this administration, and the Inflation Reduction Act is anticipated to create more than 1.5 million jobs over the next decade. We have not had an unemployment rate this low in more than 50 years, and the clean energy economy plays a very important role in this economic renaissance. Unlike my colleagues across the aisle who want to promote falsehoods about this uh, imaginary war on energy, Democrats recognize that the transition to clean energy is not just good for our climate and good for our planet, but also good for our economy and good for our communities. Every single one of our districts is profiting right now from the benefits of projects funded by the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. In fact, a company in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, in uh, the Good Chairman's District, is receiving $480 million in bipartisan infrastructure law funding for sustainable battery manufacturing. Another company in Calvert City, Kentucky, also in the Chairman's District, which I use by way of illustration, is receiving up to $35 million in federal cost share under the Inflation Reduction Act to electrify 
and decarbonize its heating process. This is taking place all over America today. This is happening now. These types of investments are significant and historic. They're exactly what we need to move away from the dangerous dependence on fossil fuels. And that's not a, a question of moral guilt. The whole society is implicated in it, but we've got to save ourselves from the implications of it. I commend the work of the Biden-Harris administration. I commend you, Madam Secretary, for everything you've been doing to ensure the United States is able to transition effectively away from dirty energy to clean energy, while also making sure that our economy is strong. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Today, we are joined by the Honorable Jennifer Granholm, who was sworn into office on February 25, 2021, as the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witness will plead Maryland. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Granholm, welcome to the Oversight Committee. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your great hard work on behalf of the American people. And um, let me start with something that I mentioned before, which is we actually have record high production of gas and oil right now. Isn't that right? Correct. But will you explain how that's measured and how that's monitored? Well, we are um, the oil and gas industry. Uh, we are record exporters of liquefied natural gas. None of that has been stopped. Uh, we are the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. We are the world's largest producer of oil, crude oil as well. Yeah. So you're undertaking this public interest process that the very distinguished gentleman from Louisiana just invoked. You are in the middle of that process. Um, and so you have paused um, uh, in the LNG export permit process, what effect will that actually have on LNG exports in the near and foreseeable future? Yeah, thank you for the question, because it has absolutely no impact on any exports that are happening now. We have authorized 48 billion cubic feet of export of liquefied natural gas, 48 billion. That is three times what we are currently exporting. We are, ex we are the largest exporter at 14 billion cubic feet. Uh, and in, in addition to that, we have authorized another 22 that are under construction, 22 billion that are currently under construction. The bottom line is so much has happened in terms of exports of liquefied natural gas since the last assessment was done. We have exploded in our authorizations. So this, this uh, pause only applies to new ones coming down the pike. Everybody who's exporting now, everybody who's under construction, everybody who is authorized, who doesn't have a, a, a final investment decision, all can proceed. We are the biggest exporter. We will continue to be exporting, and it will not affect the jobs. It will not affect what is happening already uh, in terms of exports. Well, our colleague invites us to imagine that there's some kind of categorical ban on exports of liquefied natural gas and that there's some sort of cutoff taking place. Is there a cutoff? There is no cutoff. There is no cutoff. We have to do an assessment of what's in the public interest, given the huge amounts that we have authorized. But that assessment's going forward. It's the not about any of the forward. projects that are currently taking place now, right? Correct. That's correct. OK. So we want to try to restore some sense of proportion and reality to the conversation. I know there's this effort to uh, define your, poli your policies bizarrely as a war on energy. Um, can you just r respond to that uh, convoluted rhetorical claim? Well, um, I think that the United States right now would be considered energy dominant. We are number one in oil and gas. We are number one in exports. And we are aggressively seeking to be larger in our deployment of renewable energy as well, which is what Congress has given us the authority to do. So we are an energy country, and we will remain uh, an energy exporting country, even as we continue to uh, uh, deploy, deploy, deploy renewable energy for use at home. Okay, the ex-president just went before a whole bunch of oil and gas executives and essentially demanded that they give his campaign a billion dollars because he was going to release a rash of regulations reversing climate progress and reversing the policies 
of your administration. He promised to auction off more leases for oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and has been repeatedly chanting, chanting uh, at rallies, drill, baby, drill. Um, what would happen if, to our climate goals if um, we actually undertook to reverse all of the progress made under the Biden-Harris administration? Well, uh, obviously, we want to get to net zero by 2050 as a nation, but also in conjunction with uh, all other nations on the planet who are seeking to address climate change for the reasons that you um, stated in your opening statement in terms of the number of extreme weather events, which cost us so much more than addressing climate change costs us. Yeah. In the end, we have to, we have a, a responsibility to our citizens. As Secretary of Energy, do you think climate denialism is dangerous to the future of, of our country? Of course it is. It's, it's dangerous to us as humans. It's dangerous to our economy as well. The opportunity in clean energy is enormous across the country. So. And I remember there was a time when the Secretary of Energy would appear to be at odds with the Secretary of the EPA and the people working on environment. But tell us about the, the inside of the administration. You have these record levels of gas and oil production and other uh, renewable energies moving forward. But do you see your job as opposed to the job of the people who are working to preserve our climate? Not at all. Uh, we work in conjunction with uh, the Department of Interior, the EPA. We work together, and we want to make sure that we're producing energy enough to keep the lights on and to keep people moving, but we do it in the cleanest way possible, and we can do both. Well, thank you for your hard work. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Sessions from Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Secretary, welcome. 